Hello and welcome to today's video. This time we'll be having a look at my vintage pickups for the month of March 2024 and quite a lot there was too. So sit back, relax and let's get to it. Okay then, so we'll start off with this one, which is a final stage. Um, so I've got so many books this time around. Um, we've got an awful lot to be having a look at, um, but you know, it is what it's going to be, I'm afraid to say. We've had the London Paperback Show. I've been book hunting locally. I've been book hunting with Dorset Bob. I've had a few trips here, there and everywhere to local towns. So consequently, I have picked up some stuff. Um, and a few of it is going to be, you know, it's duplicates. It's going to be moved on. But in a lot of cases, this is um, uh, all new to me. So absolutely fantastic. This one I'd not seen I'd seen a picture of this, but never actually uh, owned one. Um, 1975. There we are. Look at that. Final stage. Hmm. Just have a quick look. With the anthologies, I'd have a quick look inside, see who's in there. There's a Barry Marsberg there. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Now, as I said, I was at the uh, London Paperback Show, so I did pick up a few books which perhaps we might consider slightly more questionable condition-wise, but sometimes in the heat of the moment, you have to take a bit of a punt. And I did do that with some of these, but this one actually doesn't seem too bad. It's uh, a science fiction number 110, Pell Toro. Pretty sure that's a pseudonym of Lionel Fanthorpe. And that's actually not too bad at all. That's so... Uh, few little marks. Looks like it's had a sticker over there at some point. Yeah, look at that. Thumbs just lifting that little bit of sticker up. It might have been repriced at 25p because it's a later one. Some of the later ones, if the publisher had a bit of overstock of them, they would reprice them um, in decimal and um, that might have had a 25 pence over it at some point. But that's okay. We're going to have a few badges today. Uh, this is another one I picked up by th at the paperback show. This one, I, it's an Avon. This is an American one. It's got that spine crease, but it's, it's a really uh, nice, yeah, nice jacket on that one. Don Donald Henderson Clark, Avon 408. I've got a few Avons. You don't really see them over here very often. Right, so it looks like it's got a spine we're going to need to re-glue. But that's okay, we can do that. There we are, straight into the book. So we'll take the £4.50 out. As it was, it was only priced at 3 50 And I'll tell you what, at that London paperback show, the dealers were great. They all gave a little bit of discount, which was fantastic, you know. But yeah, I don't mind Avon books. Much harder to find than... Um, Dells of this period, you know, 1940s. And uh, yeah, we're going to need to look at that. We're going to need to get some glue in there, aren't we? Just bending it back so we can get the glue in. There we are. Now, I've got some more Prits to do, but I think this should be fine for what we've got to do here with a bit of luck. Yeah. That glue has aged, eh? I'll pop that spine back in. There we are. Yeah, that'll be absolutely fine. Give the cover a nice polish in a while and that'll be a uh, perfecter. Here's another one from that uh, collection that came in at the uh, paperback show. And Edgar Pangorn, The Judgment of Eve. It's a Penguin Science Fiction, but it's slightly later than my... Oh, look at that one. <laughs> look at that. It literally has come away. Um, it's a 70s one, I believe. Published 1970, so exactly 1970. So we are going to need to re-glue this one as well. It's 
so when they come away completely and that just sort of fell a, fell apart in my hands didn't it that one so i usually put one row on there and i do another row on the actual um block there which is really clean compared to that last one and uh, the two should uh marry up quite nicely and we should be able to get them in like so see loads of dust on this one I only use Pritt stick because it's one of those ones that's very, very easy to uh, to correct any errors if should you go wrong. It is designed for paper products, and you can see, you know, we'll give this a proper dust in a minute, but you can see the <laughs> the dust lines on there. Apart from that, look at that, it's actually really nice. It's probably unread that. So right on the cusp of my collecting period, but because it's Penguin and it's science fiction, I sort of... Uh, I make an exception. I sort of take all of those, you know, um, because I'm trying to collect sort of penguin science fiction across the board. Here's another one, exactly the same collection, same sort of era, the John Brunner, but this one's spine is actually absolutely fine. And what was this one? This was also 1970, yeah, so very, very similar period. It's got a little two pounds inside, but we'll soon, we'll soon sort of that. Yeah, lovely. That's gorgeous, isn't it? Another one here. Um, 2224. Now, this one I might have, but because it was in this same collection, it was in such exceptional condition, I thought I'm not going to leave it behind. Um, even if I've already got it, I'm going to have my other one as a reader, so I'm not going to go wrong. Now, I don't remember a month when I picked up quite as many paperbacks as I did in March 2024. I mean, admittedly, it was just loads of things on, so I got lucky. Now, this one, sadly, it has come detached again, so I need to re-glue it. Um, it's a, a good little anthology, so I'll do the same again as what we did just now, and the hope that I will be able to actually put this back together, but it's not going to be perfect, I'm afraid, because the actual text block is in two parts so we've basically got well, in fact it's in three so we can only do a half reasonable job you know yeah we'll slide that in there Evidently, some of the gluing of the penguins around this period was quite questionable. And you find that when you're doing a run of a, a publisher, um, they were just bound a particular way at that point in time. And all the books historically, you know, this is like 55 years later when this book was published. Um, the books have ended up, the glue's just disintegrated. And you do find that now and again. So that's not going to be perfect by any means. But it's better than not having a copy at all. That's the way I'm going to look at that. So it's not great, but I'm not going to overly stress on that one. And ultimately, these were just they only cost a pound, so it wasn't the end of the world, you know. Um, that'll do as a place filler for a pound. Um, I did get some very nice uh, Fontanas off um, a dealer. That one's got a little three and six, which I'm going to try and pop back in. Because that three and six would have been put there by the publisher. So I'm going to glue that back on, like so. Now, I have already got some of these Fontanas, these ones with Tom Adams covers. This one isn't a Tom Adams. This is before he started, actually. But I have got this one. I remember the girl eating the apple um, jacket. But um, some of my Fontana Christie's are in quite low grade. So rather than not have them at all, I'm going to compare mine for upgrades and different editions and what have you, you know. Um, but I'm not fussed overly I, about what printing they are. I just like one of each of the different covers in Fontana. But the earlier the printing, the better. And we've got quite a few Christie's to get through today, which is cool. Now this one is a Tom Adams cover. It's quite distinctive style. 
And these were all, I bought them as a job lot at the London Paperback Show, and they all appeared to be an original owner collection, i.e. they'd been bought from new, and that was it. Now, this one here, you can see, there was a seven-year gap. The fourth impression was 1959, and this fifth impression was 1966. That's a seven-year gap. So this would have been the first time that that particular jacket by Tom Adams was used. So that is is the first in that format, a first thus, as it were. So those, ideally, is what I'd be looking for. But if they are later printings and I haven't got the book at all, I'm definitely keeping it until an earlier one should come along. Um, this is almost certainly... Um, a reprint that I've already got, but it may be with a different jacket. See, it's hardly ever out of print, was it? So chances are I've, I've got this exact edition in my pan collection anyway, but I'm not going to let that matter. My uh, sister's a big Agatha Christie fan, absolutely loves her. And uh, I'm going to be offering her the doubles first. Because <sighs> she is a big fan. That's nice. It might be better than the one I've already got, and that's what I'm looking for. Here's another Tom Adams one. I think there's actually two of the two copies of this one in here. They came to Baghdad. Interesting with that that horrible bug there, you know. Ooh, bit grim, eh? Bit grim. So this one, it's quite interesting. So they printed it in 1960 and then it was February 65. So was it five years and then this was the first time that that one was printed? I don't know, but that's the sort of detective work that Christie fans are really good at. So <laughs> um, Evil Under the Sun. Now this one's grey. I, I remember this this cover. So I'm pretty sure I've got it, in which case, but I'm pretty sure my sister hasn't got it. So uh, she, Evil Under the Sun is her favourite of all the Agatha Christie's. Uh, she loves the book, she loves the film of it as well. The Peter Euston offers Poirot. And if she hasn't got this one, I'm sure she hasn't, then this will be heading heading to her collection of uh, Agatha's. Here's another great one, Towards Zero. There's another copy of Towards Zero later on, um, which was the first Tom Adams cover. This is the, his second one. So, interestingly, they used the same artist to redo some of his earlier work. And uh, we shall see that in a minute. So this is his first one, actually. I think that's probably quite scarce, because the 67 one by Tom Adams is more like a psychedelic cover, so I don't think I've got this one at all. I've got his psychedelic one. I thought that was a later one, but evidently the other way around. Now, this is nice. So I picked up from Bob a little run of four square science fiction. Well, these were also just a pound to me, so I was really, really pleased. And uh, I've been getting into four square science fiction in a big way. So I actually prefer the 60s stuff, but the 70s Bruce Pennington sort of era as well is equally amazing. I agree. So we'll see. But um, I've got quite a nice run of four square but i'm concentrating at the moment on trying to pick up um, old four square science fiction titles if i can um i did see one out and about just yesterday as we filmed this it was in a second hand bookshop in totnes they had a copy of um new maps from hell by uh, kingsley amos but i didn't buy it because it was hammered here's another penguin a slightly earlier one 1963 don't think I got this one at all, which was really cool. And beautiful condition as well, just how we like it. Cool. Nice to actually get a pan that I didn't have. Um, I think this was from the London Paperback Show. Death of an Old Sinner. Yeah, quite nice, that one. Um, the cover artist isn't credited, but it does look like, a bit like a pef, doesn't it, with the uh, facial expressions? It's either Pef or possibly Taylor. Hopefully it's a first. Yeah, it's a first from 1961. A little bit of tanning, but I'm not going to be too worried about that. Just nice to get. Yeah, it's nice that one. Always good to get the odd pan. 
Oh, here's another Agatha. They do it with mirrors and Tom Adams jacket. Great one that with the guns there. These are so eminently readable. 1968, this one. I mean, that's probably only been read the once or twice, possibly. It's in really great condition. Oh, here's another four square science fiction, Brian Aldiss. Oh, that's lovely, that. That is lovely. The next one of his I want to read, and I've got it in four square actually, is Hot House. That's the next one of his that's on my list to read. Would have liked to have met Aldis. I had a bit of um, had an email exchange with his son because his son ran an old the oldest website for quite a while, and a fair while back I posted this picture. It was of Jimi Hendrix reading a copy of um, uh, Penguin Science Fiction edited by Brian Aldis, which was really good. And Hendrix himself is like sat in a coffin. It's a really good picture. And um, Aldous' his son had seen it and he said, oh, I've never seen this picture of my dad, my dad's book before. And it was being read by none other than um, Jimi Hendrix, which was pretty cool. Here's the mirror cracked. Third impression. I'm checking all the printings on these. They were even actually, even the side writing seems a little bit different to the later ones. It's sort of a mid, a mid uh, changeover one, that. Oh, no. And here is yet another Brian Aldis, Space, Time and a Thunder, 14 short stories. Quite, it's quite chunky, this one. I just want to say the pages of... Oh, look at that. That might be why. Look, it's got the insurance thing inside. I don't think this has ever been read, you know. 1966, that looks and feels absolutely mint, that one. Yeah, that feels absolutely mint, that one. But it also feels as if you're not careful, it might well, um, it may well break the spine, you know what I mean? But look at that, it's quite a nice one, that. There is a tiny nick just out the bottom of the spine there. I'm going to put a smidgen of glue in there because it might be double layered, actually. Yeah, it's just got a bot nick at the bottom of the spine there. Right, double game. Another one picked up from the paperback show. This is a digit, definitely one I haven't got. Digit D211. Um, I haven't been picking up many digits lately. I haven't just haven't come across them. They're scarce in the wild anyway, but I haven't really been pursuing filling any little gaps. Um, but that one's all right. Yeah, a war story covered by Osborne. Let's put that wedge over there. Honestly, we've got so many to get through, you just wouldn't believe. Mac Reynolds, another four square science fiction. But, you know, I'd like to do it all in one hit, if I can, even if the video ends up being watched, in, if, if you watch it yourself in uh, in parts. But if it just gets ridiculous, I will split this video into two, but we'll see how we get on. I may need to do it over two weeks. <laughs> Hercule Poirot's Christmas. This is another one. Um, it's a pan reissue. Actually, it may be a pan first, you know, X721. Let's have a look. Yeah, look at that. It's a first pan, 1967. I don't think I've got this one, actually. So that actually it's got a bit of spine roll, which I think I'll probably be able to sort out. You see that spine roll there? It's just sort of, it's pretty minor. I think when it's actually on the shelf, surrounded by a few cousins, I think it'll sort itself out. But that is, uh, that's really nice, that. Um, here is another odd digit. I picked this one up because it was two pounds. I thought well, that's pretty nice condition for two pounds for an early digit. On reflection, I have a feeling I've got this one, but it's, Probably not in that condition. That is absolutely gorgeous. So you don't generally find the early digits in tip-top shape, and that one is nice. <laughs> this one I picked up on a bit of a whim, 
is I like Cleopatra related stuff. I love the original uh, movie from the 60s. It's fantastic. So Cleopatra's blonde sex rival. And all these sorts of Cleopatra related books were all on the back of the great 60s movie, the Elizabeth Taylor movie. So, um, oh God, so they had 20 pounds inside this. They were two pounds each. So I did very well there. This was off a dealer at the paperback show, but he was in the ephemera affair. And uh, he said, anything there, anything in a bag is two pounds. Anything out of a bag is a pound. I said, okay, mate. Yeah, so brilliant. Look at that. The Anguished Girl Screams, 1962. Yeah, okay. Back to something a bit more down to earth. <laughs> Penguin Science Fiction. Now, this is another one. Look at that, the, the bottom nick there, it's all, I mean, it's, it's just, in fact, it's just come off. So there was nothing I could really do about that, sadly. But Eight Man Spaceman, pleased to get there. First time I've seen a copy in the flesh and in nice nick as well. Look at that, 1972. That is pretty nice, isn't it, that? What a shame that the bottom of the spine there is uh, come away. But it's still, it's still not bad. Look at that, edited by... Stover and Harrison and a David Pelham cover, yeah. All good, that. All good stuff. Yeah, nice little book. Uh, these all only had two pounds inside, which is quite interesting. I said I got them for a pound each, so I, I think I'd, I got the even better deal. But I wonder why, uh, I mean, I would have just stuck them out if it was me. Right, Agatha Christie, Taken at the Flood, X348. Now, this is another Poirot. Um, cover although not marked it looks like w francis phillips did that one and i would imagine this is probably a reprint yes yeah, second printing from 65 i'll double check to see if it was the first with that particular jacket but quite nice to have and uh, here's the original destination i thought this was the original but evidently it's not because Seventh Impression, 1967. So I think this edition was only around for a year, and then it changed to that later one that we saw from 1968. It's one of my favourite Tom Adams jackets. He did the cover to Colonel Sun, of course, which was also sort of psychedelia and uh, Dali-esque. And this is, I just think it's terrific. Doesn't really have a lot of bearing on the story itself, but um, it's very much of the time. That is 1967 all over, isn't it? Gorgeous, that. Uh, very, very nice. Here's another penguin, look. That same sort of period. Shame that all the uh, Philip K. Dicks and stuff from this period are not included. I mean, I've got them, but I've got a friend who's looking for uh, Man in the High Castle in Penguin. Penguin first. That's another nice one. And these are all going to polish up just lovely now that we've going to need a polish and a brush of course now i picked this one up it's a reprint my guess is it's probably 1936 because it shows the first 50 books on the back um this is ariel which was the first ever uh, penguin book penguin number one it's got the dust wrapper flaps included there we are and it's the fourth from june 1936 there we are so uh there we are. That is Ariel. So I am trying to get the different editions of Ariel, um, the different printings rather. There we are, number one, the first ever penguin. Um, so that's why I picked it up. So it was uh, like a fiver on that one. So well worth it in the wrapper. Um, taken at the flood. Oh, it's another copy taken at the flood. So there you are. This one far the worse for wear. This is very, very. Look at it it's falling to bits. I bet you this is a first. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet you that's a first, and it was. Why wasn't the other one, the reprint, the first? But that is too tatty to keep. So I'm not really even going to keep that one, even as a filler, because he's a bit a bit too far gone. So pop that down in the bin. Ladies won't wait. Okay, Peter. So this is a fairly early Fontana. Look at that number 27. And uh, although I don't go out of my way to collect... Fontana per se, I do really like them because they're a continuation of the Collins Crime Club and they are actually high quality books, they're well produced, um, so they do feel really great to read. 
to even today, you know, so that's why I uh, I like them. 1954, this one. So a cool 70 years old as we film this. The thing is, all right, the cover looks a little bit dated, but that doesn't feel like a 70-year-old book, does it? Very nice, very nice. Ah, so one of a couple of, a couple of compacts that I picked up. Um, I only need about 10 compacts for all the science fiction. This is one of them, and it's got a cover by Keith Roberts there as well. So very pleased to get this. Compacts don't tend to turn up in terrific shape, sadly. They're usually a bit the worse for wear. This one's not bad. I think I've got the other one, which is worse condition. Is it slightly? Yeah, so it seems like it's ever so slightly um, trimmed, possibly over trimmed. But yeah, that's OK. It's still nice to have one I've not got. And here's the other copy of uh, They Came to Baghdad with that nice cover with the bug on. So as I said, I thought I had a double of it. And this is a slightly later printing than the one that we saw. So I'll probably end up keeping the uh, the first copy that we saw. Always a good one. Body in the Library, one of my favourite Christie's. I like this one a lot. Turned over page there. How very dare they. Third print in July 67. Probably the first with that terrific jacket. More penguin. Alternating currents. We got so much to get through, you just wouldn't believe. 1966. Um, I've been sent some stuff to review. Um, some of it we've already done the dedicated reviews of you as you watch this. Others um, will be just around the corner. But everything I have been sent or everything I've been reading, I am going to show you on this video as well. So you've, you're fully up to date with it all. Lord Edgware dies. Great title, great cover. Look at that with the older paper knife in the back of the skull. A lot of these have got that little tick there. It's almost as if this owner, as I said, this was an original owner, they were ticking the books that they'd read. So you sort of see that when you buy a run of the same author, just so you remember which ones you've read and which ones you haven't. So quite a common thing. Definitely haven't got that one, Hound of Death. Not with that jacket. That's the paperback first, yeah, first pot issued in 1964. Very, very pleased with that. Yeah, it's one I haven't got, and it's the uh, the first paperback of that. That's great. The Clocks. Yeah, that's a nice solid copy of that one. Probably already got that one in some form. Um, another pan, definitely got this one, G106, Secret of the Chimneys. What print is this? Just a reprint, yeah. So it's a reprint from 1958, but that's fine. No reprints are fine. Um, there are people who just like these early, they collect these early pan ones, like they collect the Fontana Tom Adams jackets. Once I've got them all, and I haven't got them all yet, but once I've got them all, I shall do a video just on the... Tom Adams, Agatha Christie's. There we are, a little, uh, little tick again. There we are. I picked this one up in Dorset when I was book shopping with Dorset Bob. It was in the uh, not in the pannier market because that was shut but it was on a little bookstore outside where the pannier market generally is and this was a pound for a little corgi tea series western the brass and the blue so i can only surmise it's about the civil war which is quite a cool subject who 
hoping this one pound sticker comes off all right. Always a bit of a tense moment. But we're okay. There we are, a haunted man's desperate search for courage. Yep, another one with a little tick inside. Royce, Roger Hall, Roger Hall did the cover painting there. Lovely, nice stuff. Right, we've got about another dozen or so books and then I'm going to um, give those a brush and I'm going to give them a polish as well. So we've done at least some of it. We're not even halfway through the A format paper paperbacks yet. And I've got a big stack of B format stuff as well. We've got loads, old hardbacks and, as I said, stuff that um, I've been sent for review and what have you, and new releases. So it's going to be a bit of an episode this time round, but some months that's how they go, you know. So once again, I don't remember that cover for Death Comes as, as the End. Yeah, look, 1968. That would have been the first in that in that form, which is extremely cool. Uh, now this one I've picked up. I do actually have this exact edition, and I've picked it up for a, a vintage read. Um, However, it has got this two pounds sticker on the front, which once again, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to get it off. In fact, it looks like it's going to be quite, it did behave itself, look at that. So yeah, I've already got this exact edition, so it's not, it was literally just to read. Don't even know what printing it was. Well, it is actually the, oh, it is a reprint from 73. So it's not the first, but as I said, it's uh, going to be on my, TBR pile. Um, this one I picked up also with Dorset Bob. It was quite a nice one. Um, it wasn't expensive. I think it was a couple of quid maybe. I got charged for this one. It says two fifty. What a month it's been. <laughs> Mental. Mental March, I think I'm going to have to call it. Another, that's quite a nice one. This is from uh, Dorset Bookshop. It was absolutely perfect, that one. Um, she had five in it. She charged me four, which is all right, I thought. It's James Joyce. It's a heavy book. So you buy this through the post, it's going to be three quid. Three pound thirty. Post is really heavy. Um, and it was absolutely immaculate. So that's if you're going to have later 60s penguins, that's sort of how I want them. Um, I picked this one up. This is, once again, I've got Jaws, but the, my copy is really hammered. And this this still isn't the first printing. This is just a reprint. This is number 13. Um, oh, look. Dear Jew, this is the book I said you could borrow. Okay. Okay, John. <laughs> You believe it. At least John wrote it in pencil. We'll assume that she did borrow it, read it, loved it, because it's a great book and a really good film. And then she thought she'd pass it on. However, that little note, or inclusion, as they call it, can uh, be lost in the midst of time. Now, this also has a sticker on the front, so I'm hopeful, since I've just spent that time cleaning up the insides, if I can get this sticker off, that's actually, although it's a bit sunned on the spine, 
a not bad copy of Jaws, which is it's a surprisingly difficult paperback to find in nice condition. And even online, copies are going for like 20 quid. I just don't understand what's going on. You know, I do not understand what's going on. This one's going to require it to be slow. Slow but sure. It's coming. There we are. So I'll give that a brush and a polish in a minute. And that's actually quite a nice copy of Jaws. So I'm fairly, fairly pleased with that. Um, this one, uh, once again, it was only a pound. It was in like, one of the shops in Dorset. Once again, it's got a blooming sticker on, but I'm hoping that once again, we're going to be in luck. Well, we were. The, the bookshop sticker came straight off. That's revealed another sticker underneath. Book and record exchange, one and six, seven and a half P. Can we get that one off? I think once again we're going to be okay. Cool, this is going to take a bit of time. I think. Oh, it's going to leave a mess. It's a horrible mess. Good job is I've got another copy of this. Ha ha ha. Um, which is far better. So this can be my spare. Oh, yes, it's not not a nice sticker. This one, this really vintage one. Try and get it into the picture. Sort of working my way out, going in on this. There we are now, but it is actually quite messy. So what I'm gonna do is give it a square and leave that for a bit. While we do this last little pile, and then we're gonna have a brush because then we'll be approximately halfway through the A format paperbacks. What we've not had are any of the, uh, the Dorset Bob ones from the show, the really nice ones. So uh, we shall have those to come. I don't think I got this one. Pocket full of right, pretty sure I've not got that. Don't recognise it anyway, maybe, maybe. Pan, it's an X, just a plain X. Parker Pine investigates. It's the first printing from 1968, so that's pretty good. Once again, I don't think this is one I've got, you know, in pan first, so that's cool. Yeah, that's all right. The murder of Roger Ackroyd, pretty sure I got this. It's a 60s one again. Yeah, so this is the first edition of this in five years from Fontana, so I suspect this is the first time with this rather groovy cover, which I think is a Tom Adams. And this next one, I, I picked up the giant mystery wheel. It's a huge, huge, huge Avon. Look at the size of it. Now, I was expecting it to be a bit on the rough side. And it may be that this is going to warrant its own... Yeah, you see it's coming away there. It's a huge book. I think it's probably been re-glued at some point. And it sort of needs, it needs to come off because it's not too bad, that spine. It sort of needs to come off and have another re-gluing effort done to it. But yeah, it has got a John Dixon Carr story. Inside, it's not actually too bad. 
yeah, it's got an Agatha Christie in there as well. A Ray Bradbury, a Dashiell Hammett. Look at that. It's got incredible content. Even an Agatha Christie, a Leslie Charteris. So it's a great tome. Two full-length books. So there we are. It just needs... I don't think the whole thing is going to come to bits, but um, I'm not going to muck around with this one right now because it's going to need a bit of thought, but I am going to give it the dust and give it a polish, and then we'll, let, we'll see how it's looking after that. <sighs> Let's see on this one here. Let's see if this has improved at all. Yeah, there we are. That sticker's virtually come off now. A tiny little mark where it was. Yeah, the last little bit there. So that polish sort of ate into that old glue that you couldn't see. The polish ate into that old glue where that sticker was and got it off. So brilliant. So I didn't actually remember checking inside this. Yeah, sorry, as I said, I've got a second copy of this one, so it's okay. Right, so the next step of the process then is I'm going to give, that's almost like a, a little pause period. Um, because I'm going to be doing this video over um, a couple of days, um, but I'm not going to go through any more books now, but I'm going to brush and polish the ones that we've just done. So we should do that right now. Right, here we go then. So, give all these old books a bit of a clean. We know internally they're as good as we can get them. So now it's doing the outsides. This is always the mucky bit. Definitely the mucky part of the, the job. But it doesn't take long. Thank you. 
nice little pile of brushing. There we are. Right, next stop is to give all those books a polish. Right, so a day has passed. I've uh, had a break overnight because I've been uh, at it quite a bit lately. And uh, we're back to uh, give these first batch of A formats uh, the polish, which is what we shall do right now. Not all of them. Some of them have got paper sleeves, of course, but the majority of these will very much benefit from a from a polish. Of course, the one bit of the process that you're not going to see is uh, me comparing some of the books that I do already own against the copies that I've already got, because uh, to see which ones are the best, because that's going to be up in the... Uh, well, the books are stored in various places, in all honesty, so it's just not practical to make a video of that, although I have done such a thing in the past. But I'm conscious that there was literally so much that came my way in March, after not too much in February, and potentially very little in April is lined up. I've got no book dealer visits planned until May, in actual fact, so... This does give me a bit of a chance to sort of catch up, really, and consolidate what I've got and uh, get everything up to date. Now, last night, uh, Dorset Bob, who you may have come across on the channel, he, uh, he put up a new sales video, so he's launched a little YouTube channel uh, where he can just show his latest stock. And it's all sort of spine on. We've got about eight boxes of new science fiction and fantasy stocks. If that's your thing, um, head over to the channel called Mr. Book 451, as in Fahrenheit 451, but Mr. Book 451. And uh, you'll see uh, Bob's latest offerings. And then you just need to email him at Mr. Book 451 at outlook.com and uh, reserve anything. I, uh, I found a, a couple of bits that I wanted, which was cool. Which I shall keep back until I next visit. Now, the other thing that's happening today and tomorrow is I've I got myself a new computer so since I've been uh, filming in 4k it has meant that um, the videos take a lot longer to process so because of that I've uh, I need something with a bit more oomph the computer I'm using I've had for six years so it's not done me bad 
in all honesty. I can't complain at that. And it's still working. And um, I will be able to sell it on second hand. But after more than 20 years, I'm moving from Mac back to PC. So I used to go with the Macs just because they're such great systems. And they still are, but they're just underpowered for what, for video editing. For general computing, it's absolutely fine. But when you're video editing, dealing with lots of files of a large nature, you need something with a little bit more oomph. So that's, uh, that's what's going to be happening. It's also been an incredible month for uh, new publications. And uh, we'll have a look at the first batch of those. I've sort of, I'll split it into a couple of batches on this video um, after we've finished uh, polishing these because we've had some good stuff that have been published this last month or so, so it's all worth having a look at. to see these cleaning up and any little marks coming off it's really great and coming up absolutely beautiful i think a lot of these crispies not all of them but a lot of them will be upgrades to the ones i've already got which is good news the uh, the glue rippling in these compacts it's the way that they were made it's come up quite clean that one though which is good news but yeah it's got a, a bit of a ripple not massively unusual with the compact See, we can't polish because it's got a, a paper cover and that would only damage it so we don't do that this one however is absolutely fine and uh, these penguin science fictions are all really dusty don't know where they've been stored but consequently with their black covers as well they uh, they come up absolutely beautiful Very, very nice. It's almost made me want to get out all the Penguin Science Fiction again and uh, do a little checklist and see just what I'm actually missing now because I don't think it's that much. Apart from uh, cover variations, you know. Something like uh, the John Wyndham's, for example, have all had multiple editions over the years, so trying to get all of them would be a, a tall order. But trying to get all the Penguin Science Fiction in one in first printings, I think is, uh, I reckon I'm pretty close. I've got all the JG Ballards, which are sought after, but I don't have that beautiful box set, sadly. And that tends to go for about £250, so I won't be getting that in a hurry unless I get very lucky and uh, come across one cheap. Right, so that's the first stack 
of three that have been polished. So that's good. Doesn't take long to polish these. Here is uh, pile number two. More science fiction to kick us off. This looks good. Um, edited by Edward Furman and Barry Molesberg. That one. to uh, sort of fall in love with this uh, four square stroke New English Library science fiction. It's uh, absolutely superb, particularly in high grade. And at the moment, it is not that expensive to pick up. You can pick up most of this quite, quite cheaply. So uh, bear that in mind. There did seem to be quite a bit of it at the London Paperback Show. There's another one here. I mean, just look at that cover. It's uh, really something, aren't they? They really are. They did have a very distinctive look. Very clean. Almost penguin-like, in a way. like a little bit of a sticker removal there but it's um yeah i'm gonna give it a little bit of targeted use a clean bit of cloth a little bit of targeted polish i reckon there was a sticker over that Yeah, it's coming. I think it needs a bit more polish. It's very stubborn um, polish, this. Uh, sorry, sorry, stubborn glue from that sticker, so it's taken a bit of oomph to get it off. It's in two places. I think this is one of those instances where the old lighter fluid, just a dab of lighter fluid, would probably lift that last little bit there. But still a beautiful copy, absolutely gorgeous. Um, now, <clears throat> so I'm going to use a fresh bit of cloth because look how black that I got. A lot of that is dust, of course, from those uh, penguins and what have you. But yeah, it's been quite a while. I remember it was probably about 10 or so years ago. I was uh, just in town and there was like a, a pop-up charity stall in the middle of town and they had books and uh, I thought, well, that's good. And I went along and I picked up some stuff. Then they had a whole box of Agatha Christie for a tenner. I mean, it must have been like one of each, but and a lot of them were the lovely Tom Adams covers. And for whatever reason, I think probably because I was on foot or, you know, I was going to be getting the bus home or something like that, rather than um, driving, I, uh, I left it behind and that was a massive bargain. I just really regret that. <laughs> but there you go. I'm sure someone uh, had them. It was that they were being sold as a, as like a collection, you know. But not a collection I ended up getting.
dusty spine on that one. But we can live with that. Very brave of publishers to leave so much empty space, isn't it? You wouldn't really find that on books uh, today, I wouldn't have thought. Quite a bit up off that one, which was a bit of a surprise, but no less nice to see. And I suspect this one's going to go to my sister. This particular one. I must try and pick up the, uh, the movie adaptation version of Evil Under the Sun. It's quite a nice one with the movie jacket on. But I've seen it a couple of times. Well, which is in a bit of a fragile state. Let's be careful with that until a better one should come my way. Now, of course, quite a few of the later books aren't going to need that much work because they were bought from Dorset Bob from his like you know proper stock and they've already been cleaned and they're as good as you can possibly get i will of course give all my books the once over anyway and i'll debag them um so i can have a proper look at them um but yeah maybe that the second half of the a format papers doesn't take quite as long but there we are anyway that's the uh, second pile of books there now, as I said, we've had quite a lot of new books and magazines sent out to us. And the first one we'll take a look at is the Men's Adventure Quarterly. This is issue 10. Um, this is the dedicated Vietnam issue. And um, I will do a dedicated flick through this. So don't worry if you're going to, um, if I'm not taking enough time on this, because um, I will, I always cover the Men's Adventure Quarterly 
magazines in their own video. But yeah, this one's on Vietnam. I know it's got a um, piece on uh, Barry Sadler, um, creator of, uh, well, Ballad of the Green Beret and uh, the Casca books. It's also got some early work by Mario Puzo as well. This is a really great subject and I'm very much looking forward to uh, going through this one in detail. But just to let you know that this one's just been published at number 10, a little mini, mini milestone in the uh, Men's Adventure Quarterly magazine library and uh, as you can see it's absolutely packed with stuff it's a great great issue beautifully designed it's uh it's superb so these come highly highly recommended so uh track these one down they're available on amazon you can get them direct from the the publisher um as well so uh yeah men's adventure quarterly number 10 as i said full review on my channel of that one now we've also had this month two badger books um here's the first one here it's uh John Spencer and Co. Volume 3, or Number 3. Um, it's the illustrated bibliography of John Spencer and Badger books. It's by Shane Agnew. And uh, Shane's systematically gone through all the, the Badger library and uh, given uh, created the, the ultimate bibliography of the uh, publisher. All the covers here, got a cover gallery at the back, and then all the, the masses and masses of information cross-referenced who the pseudonyms are for the different authors it's uh, a real piece of work this one and uh, yeah very much recommended all three volumes in fact they do go together as a complete set um, but that's the last one number three uh, we've also had this one which is beyond the void so once again this one and shane's i've reviewed on um, on a dedicated video on the channel we did actually get to um, interview steve holland as well this is steve's one volume look at uh, Badger books, and uh, it's really comprehensive. It's a high quality. Um, it's uh, oh, as you can see, it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. I think you'll really enjoy this one. Um, all the stories behind the uh, behind the authors. It's uh, it's a great piece of work. This one, once again, a full bibliography, a bit different to the approach that Shane's taken, and this is more an overview of it, including the early gangster books, the comics, the things like that. So, uh, yeah, if you're a Badger fan. Those two books are definitely uh, worth tracking down. So that's good stuff. Now, this one's uh, been sent by my friend Gary over in the States. This is uh, Gary Lavisi. Gary's got his own dedicated vintage paperback channel. If you've not come across it, it's really great. And uh, Gary's collection is just insane. It's just brilliant. Now, he sent me this one because he says, this, Jules, this is definitely up your alley. So it's a bit of fiction. I haven't read it yet, but it's, it's from my to-be-read pile. Uh, in the not-so-distant future, men have come to Mars to escape the oppressive Earth government. Ryan is an agent of a super secret government agency, the Department of Control, the DOC, and has always been willing to do whatever his masters want of him. So this is the bit where it gets interesting. So what, but on Mars, everything is different. And all that Ryan does is read books, hard boiled noir crime paperbacks dating from the last century. In fact, such works are read and collected by everyone on Mars, even serving as a medium of exchange. Why? Is there some secret DOC plot involved? Or has Ryan conjured up a literary fantasy in his own guilt-twisted mind? Maybe he's still confined in a prison cell back on Earth, reading a science fiction novel called Mars Needs Books. <laughs> As Ryan probes deeper and deeper into the mystery, he comes to understand just one thing. He must uncover the truth. So there you go. Mars Need Books, quite an interesting premise, that one. So, uh, yeah, if that tickles your fancy, um, by Gary Lavisi, you should be able to find that without too much trouble at all. It's uh, Borgo Books. There we are. And uh, worldsidebooks.com is uh, the publisher's website. So that's, that looks quite a good read. Up now, this was from the Penguin Collector's Society. So there hasn't been their 100th issue. We're still waiting for it. So please don't contact me. I don't know when it's coming out, but it's a massive issue, which is a work in progress still. And I think it is due fairly soon, but it is. Uh, it was due at the end of last year and it still hasn't arrived just yet, sadly. Um, but in the meantime, in the interim, they have sent out this, which was uh, published by Joe Pearson at Design for Today. It's at Noah's Ark by John Mills. Um, Design for Days is a, a great publisher. They, they, they pub, they're just experts at pubbing, publishing this sort of stuff. This is a cutout. Beautiful cutout book. As you can see. And it gives you a bit on John Mills himself. In fact, I don't think it actually says something. Yeah, apologies for the continuing delay in the publication of Penguin Collector 100. The anniversary 160 page issue was scheduled to be published in September. Um, unable 
for good reasons and bad, to complete work on it. Uh, when the publication is fixed, it will be posted on the Society's website. So if you are waiting for that one, just take a look at the um, uh, take a look at the uh, you know company website. And it says, in the meantime, we are pleased to enclose copies of a facsimile edition of Puff and Picture Book 114, Noah's Ark and the Story of Noah's Ark, published jointly with Joe Pearson at Design for Today. John Mills was the author of Noah's Ark in 1960 when he was working for Penguin, honorary member of the Penguin Collector's Society, and sadly died last December. Um, but there we are. So that's a little bit on John Mills. And then this is the story of uh, Noah's Ark, which is absolutely brilliant. They did one of these before. It was the stories of life histories. But this is a very similar format. As you can see, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, a little thing on the puffing cutouts. The most, I haven't got any of them, only this one here now. Um, Puffin picture books, I do love. I've got about 50, so it's just under half the collection. But I've only got a couple of the rarer ones. Um, they don't seem to turn up, and um, I've no massive desire to collect them like that. So uh, maybe if I lick all the penguins, I might go down that route. So, yeah, so that was from the, the latest from the Penguin Collectors Society. Um, this next one I was given at the London Paperback Show um, by the editor, which is uh, Trevor Kennedy. Trevor's a really nice guy. And um, he was introduced to me by Steve Jones, the author. And uh, this is Phantasmagoria, the special edition. It's number nine. This is a Hellraiser special. So look at the size of it. It's 360 pages, 370 pages, all on Hellraiser. Loads of interviews, behind the scenes stuff. I mean, absolutely insane. It's probably the ultimate Hellraiser encyclopedia, you could say. Um, it's available... Uh, in this softback here, which is the cheapest way to, to get it. And there's also limited edition hardback as well. It's just been published, literally just like uh, um, the day before the London paperback show. So if you're interested in this, as you can see, there's stacks in it. If Hellraiser is your thing, then uh, this is the book to get. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. So I shall be popping this one uh, in my to-be-read pile because it's so much. I, I enjoy the Hellraiser. I've got to admit, I've only ever watched the first two. Um, I haven't gone past that. There is uh, Steve Jones. There's loads here, isn't there? It's good stuff. So, yeah. I remember loving the films when they first came out. There's Kim, Kim Newman there and Steve Jones. Yeah, recording the Hellraiser commentaries for the Blu-ray in March 2023. There we are. Good stuff, eh? So, uh, yeah. Phantasmagoria, the special edition series number nine, and that is all on Hellraiser. So that's good stuff. Um, this next one I was sent by uh, um, a friend of mine, Paul, and uh, Paul Barnes um, is a has been a lifelong collector. He knows that my love of penguins. So this is from this is a copy of Antiquarian Book Monthly Review from July nineteen eighty five, which was the day of Penguins' fiftieth anniversary. There's a little piece on priceless penguins. So. Um, Penguin were very much in the news because it was their 50th anniversary. And uh, page 256. Here we are. And it's just a little potted history by David Hedges, was the author, about Penguin's early years, early order forms, things like that. A bit on Puffin. There we are. So quite nice to have that little thing on uh, on Penguin there. So that, for now, is all the latest releases. So now we've got three slightly larger format books, which are just going to clean up because I've been doing the uh, larger books here. That one had a little three pounds in. This is quite nice. Um, Douglas Copefield, I have read him before. But this was his first one. It wasn't... I looked it up. I thought this might be quite a scarcity in this format, but it's not. And um, it seems to be fairly common, but quite a good book to have, Generation X. And it is the first printing of it as well. So I was pleased to get that. So um, I will just do these as we go along. Was in the uh, one of the charity shops, I believe. Oh no, it was one of the bookshops actually in Dorset, so not one of the charity shops. There we are, I'm getting uh, 
polish all over the, the desk here. Labacus. Once again, a slight uh, literary imprint. A few little marks on this one, fingerprints and what have you. grubby this one I should say not mucky grubby with a few little marks on that all white cover I'm glad I got this uh, I said I read a really good one by him a bit later I think it was called micro serifs that was pretty cool anyway that's cleaned up quite nicely um, now we've got this which is a dad's army book this cost me 125 it's not one that I've got and I do like dad's army corner dings but not too bad a full episode guide and what have you yeah that's fine nothing inside yeah little corner marks but nothing too bad sadly lost Ian Lavender this year didn't we he was the last of the original lineup to pass. But I mean, Dad's Army is on every single day, isn't it? It's uh, on one of the channels, it's just timeless. And uh, Perry and Croft, they just were great writers, weren't they? There we are. And the last in this little segment is this one. It's a book on Tony Hancock. Now, I've actually got this. I've had it since I was a kid. It's, I've got it in softback, though. Never knew it even existed in hardback. So I was delighted to come across it. When I was growing up, Hancock was just magic to me. I loved him so much. Uh, I was listening to the BBC sort of cassettes, you know, I had back then sets of the radio shows and just absolutely a magical time and I've got a fair few books on Hancock actually I always pick them up when I see them but I didn't know he, this even existed in hardback so uh, that was great a great little find once again that was with my uh, little travels with Dorset Bob so that's brilliant Right, so that's all of that. Now I think I need to go and change cameras and what have you and recharge a little bit, get myself a cup of coffee, and then we'll be back. And I think what we'll do, we shall tackle all the B format books. So we'll do them next. Okay, so we'll start with my B format books now. And I've got a fair old pile, much more than usual. And I placed the blame squarely at the feet of Nicholas Raw here. So Nicholas published this book last year. It's called White Spines, and it's all about his adventures collecting the Picador White Spine books, which I absolutely love. I had a few in my collection anyway, because they're a continuation of pan books. So my pan collection, classic pan, sort of peters out in the early 70s. And Picador themselves started in 1972, so I had a few early ones anyway. And at reading this book with uh, Nicholas's adventures um, going around the bookshops of the UK and some overseas as well, um, finding the Picadors was just a delight to read. And I've just finished reading it for a second time because the second book, the follow-up in a way, called Shadow Lines, has just been published. Now, uh, what this one is, um, a shadow line is what you see like there where I've got my bookmark in. So I only just started this last night. But that would be what's known as an insertion. And in this one, um, Nicholas is tracking down people who may have, you know, gifted a book and wrote their name inside. He tries to track down the original owner. Um, there may be something important inside. There may be a love letter, a bus ticket, an air an airplane ticket, all sorts of things, you know. So um that's what Shadow Lines is about, as well as of course continuing his um search for missing picadors from his collection. Um, so one of the very nice things I picked up in 
my Picador collection uh, recently was this bookmark. It's from 1982. Look, the 1982 Picador program highlights. Funky silver, it's single-sided. Um, probably quite scarce, but it's got some great stuff that came out in uh, 82. Good, good authors there, Emma Tennant there. Um, Bruce Chatwin, I got Midnight's Children, the Booker winner uh, by Salman Rushdie was in 82. Um, you know, Italio Calvino, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Burroughs, Ian McEwen, good names, good, good, good little uh, list they had, didn't they, really? And that's uh, a gorgeous and probably quite scarce bookmark, that. Now, here's actually quite a late one. This is a, I think this is a 90s one. It might even be 2000s. Let's have a look. 2002. Yeah. Um, now, this is a Brett Easton Ellis. This is far later than I would ordinarily pick up. But I've got it because, well, it is actually Brett Easton Ellis. Um, this is the movie tie-in to this one. Um, it's not the Picador first. Now, there is a rather awful, it looks like an HMV sticker on the front there, which I'm slightly reluctant. Oh, there's one on the back as well. It's actually, it's got $22. It's like an airport one. So I'm slightly reluctant at trying to tackle any of those, to be honest. Um, and... I mean, this is a first thus, but I would probably get rid of this if I could find the uh, the slightly early one. So I think I'm going to leave that as is, because I don't want to make any more mess than it already is. What I much prefer are these earlier ones here. These, uh, not in the, this one's not in the best of shape. And one thing I have found with Picador is that a bit like the New English Library, the paper that they were originally printed on is not tip-top quality. So in some cases the paper has aged and uh, because of that i think finding vintage picador in nice condition is actually quite tricky now you know me i'm a bit of a stickler for first paperback printings and i do like books to be in nice condition this one's you know just about passable i mean it's pretty borderline to be honest but once again until a better one comes along but you can generally spot them because the price will be cheaper. This is $1.95. Um, and this one dates from... This is a first from 1982, that one. So even something like that's 42 years old now. And you really do need to remember that when you're looking at some of these Picadors. They've got particularly scarce. And I think it's a, a bit of a hot market. It may be something Nicholas has got to do with that. Because <laughs> I can't be the only one who, uh, who's decided to pick a few up after reading his book. Because there's some great literary authors in here, many of which I have not read at all. So um, I've been really enjoying dipping my toe into some of these. And um, I think it broadens your mind sometimes to uh, try authors you've never tried before. Yeah, this one was um, 1978, that one. 125. So... These, I'm hoping, should all come up quite nicely. They will all benefit from a really good polish. So as I said, we'll do all the B-format stuff. I've got it all in a nice pile here. And we'll brush and polish that. Now, PJ O'Rourke, these um, are pretty easy to find. I think he was a, a big seller in Picador. Um, so you tend to find these without too much trouble. Um, this is a 1998 one. So a bit after my period. I probably picked this one up because I was having a duff day with everything else. So I thought, well, I'll just pick up this so that you don't go empty at home empty-handed. I've done that more than once, you know. If I'm having a bad day at the bookshops and there's nothing else left, I might go for something either A, lower quality than I would particularly ordinarily pick up, or B, like this one. It wasn't quite in my collecting sphere, but I picked it up for the hell of it. Here's another um pj wrote this one actually looks quite an interesting read um it is definitely a much earlier one might even be his first one i don't know um yeah this is a uh, 1987 this one republican party reptile well there you go Yeah, very nice. The Emperor. You see what I mean about the uh, the page age fading? This is 1984. So 
some of these I picked up in uh, Liverpool. So I got, I think I got one or two out of the Iron Bridge bookshop, I think. And they do turn up in charity shops there, which is quite cool. This is uh, a Liverpool one, I believe. Not quite sure of the typeface on that, but yeah, 1996. So once again, a little bit past my uh, cutoff point, but I've picked it up all the same, and it's got a name inside. But apart from that, he's, uh, it's okay. I think I may have got that one locally. I can't, just can't remember now. Um, this one I picked up in Liverpool. It was brand new on red. It's part of the SF Masterworks series. I don't mind paying £3 for these if they're brand new. Um, they've re-released, or they are re-releasing a lot of the SF Masterworks, uh, but with very plain typographical covers. They're awful. Um, I mean, this isn't one of the best, but at least it's got an illustration on but some of them are, I'm not kidding you, they are terrible. So I'm picking these up when I can get them, to be honest. I'll pop that one with my new books because that doesn't need any sort of cleaning. Well, actually, it might. So no. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, a Doris Lessing here. So with my pick of doors, what I've been doing, I've got a spreadsheet. Um, which I'd be happy to share with anyone if, if you're interested. I can just drop me an email and I'll send it on. Uh, my one itself came from Nicholas Raw uh, when I wrote to him um, about a couple of uh, penguin related things. And um, yeah, it's quite early, 1976. So this is uh, from the fourth year of uh, Picador. Um, and the way I've done it, I've got it's like a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet. And it's split into the year. So, like for 1972, for example, there was eight Picadors published. So, and all the ones I've got, I've just highlighted them. So I know what I've got and what I'm missing by referring to my checklist. So if I'm out and about, I can always call that up. Um, and as long as I can see when the book was first printed, I'll be able to look it up and see if I've got it or not. So that's how I'm doing it because they're not numbered by any means. And I think doing it that way is quicker than having the whole lot listed by author or title, you know. At least that's what I think. Not quite a big one, that. That's actually got the three novels in. That's cool. It's the Mountain People commentary. What a great jacket. And that's something about these Picadors. They took some pride in their jackets, didn't they? They're all quite, quite special. It's a non-fiction one. Yeah, I went to this bookshop in Liverpool. It was called Reeds of Liverpool. And um, a very interesting book there. I've been a book there a long time, but he wouldn't let me film there. Um, I went in and asked. He said, no, I don't, I don't want to be online at all. I said, OK, fair enough. But I don't know why, because he had the best sort of books in Liverpool, from what I saw. The best selection of books, you know. So a bit of a shame that I couldn't show you what he actually had there. Brilliant military history section. I mean, uh, but he seemed a little, almost like embarrassed by his stock, which I don't know what the reason was behind that, but that's just the impression I got. But I did end up sitting down and having a really good chat with him. He realised I was a, I was a book person, and we spoke about the woes of the book trade at the moment. But he was busy because I think he was quite near the university, so we had lots of uh, students coming in while we were there. You know. So this is a fairly early one, I think. 1973, yeah. So this is the second year of Picador. Oh, no, 74. Jonathan Cape in 73, Picador edition 74. So, yeah, third year of Picador. But even so, quite a nice early one. That looks 75p on the back. So that will definitely benefit from a good, good brush, the mountain people. Hadrian the Seventh. And you really only have a chance of finding early ones like this in the second-hand bookshops or online. This one came from my local bookshop. It was from uh, 1978. Um, yeah, my local bookshop is... Uh, I went Last time I went in, they were having a bit of a sale. And it was three paperbacks for a fiver. And I was able to pick up some nice edge books, which, um, well, we'll see them in a minute. I was particularly pleased to get this one, Heroes and Villains, Angela Carter. Another pretty early one. Um, 
yeah, in fact, this was one of the first eight. So that is one of the first eight that I was missing. Um, what a great jacket. Cover painting, Grunwald. 40p when that first came out. Lovely. Don't mind Angela Carter. Oh, this is uh, another one. This is probably the, my most expensive Picador, to be honest. It's quite, quite collectible. I got lucky and found a little buy it now, and he took a best offer. So I got this for about eight pounds. Um, also from the first eight, very early there, 1972. An original toughie, that one, for trout fishing in America. It's a bit of a cult book, from what I understand. Um, this is quite nice. This is the Tolkien Companion. And I hear this is actually pretty good. So um, there is a revision. There's a second printing, which I think corrects a couple of errors. But I believe this is the first. Yeah, this is the first from 1977. And uh, it's reasonably difficult to find, but they are out there should you uh, really want one. Uh, Santorium under the sign of the hourglass. Wow. Another reasonably early one. I said these are very much going to benefit from a good polish, a brush and a polish. Because as I said, as you can see, the Picador paper doesn't age very well. So I think you have to be quite lucky to find them in nice condition, in all honesty. They do tend to yellow up quite, quite quickly. And the only other publisher I know that does that is New English Library. So uh, there you go. I, I got sent a couple of these copies of New Worlds. And we actually have another one to look at in a minute. These are once again from my friend Paul Barnes. And he sent them to me because they both got uh, Wyndham related content. This one's um, a review of the Day of the Triffids, the movie, the first movie. And uh, this one's got uh, a new John Wyndham novelette in this one. So uh, he said, although they're not in the best of shape condition wise, um, there we are for all the night. It is, um, they are worth having. And I, I, out of all the pulps that exist, that have ever been published, New Worlds is the one I've got the most of, and I didn't have either of those. So, um, Another one in like the B format series, and I've got a few of these actually. Um, I tried only pick up the authors I, I sort of know about or want to dip my toe in. I've got, for example, Elizabeth Taylor, the author, not the actress. I've got all of hers in Virago Modern Classic, and I really like those editions. I have decided I'm going to start picking these up if they're first printings and they're in nice condition and they're, like you know, a couple of quid. I don't mind paying that each for them. Um, they sometimes turn up in lots. You get, like, 20 or something. Yeah, um, they're all women authors, and... Um, my uh, my friend, my best man, actually, when I got married, his parents were in the book business and they knew the founder of Virago. I can't remember her name now, but they knew her very well. And um, I do quite, well, I, I have always uh, enjoyed the list. There you are, and they are numbered at Virago Modern Classic 303. Um, I do, once again, have a list of the first sort of 500 or so. Not that I'm looking to collect them all. I'm just going to pick them up when I see them. And the last Picador, this is one that I picked up... Um, in Newton Abbott and Totnes recently, I was up there with my friend Andy. We did. I got this one in the Totnes Castle books. It's once again. It's later than my regular period. It's at nineteen ninety three, but I picked it up because it's only two pound and it's signed by the author, Charles Nickel, who I know not a lot about. But I thought I'm going to give it a go because I haven't got any signed Picadors until this one. So, so there you go. And that is all the uh, B format books looked at um, and internally cleaned as good as we can get them. The next thing we need to do is give them a damn good brush because I think they're quite dusty, some of these. And then we're going to give them a damn good polish as well. So that's what we're going to do next. Okay, here we go then. So I've got my trusty brush. And I imagine some of these will be absolutely fine. Other ones, I think, you know, they're going to really clean up quite nicely. That is my hope. This is always the top edges, and actually, those none of those were actually that bad. So it's a good start.
of length. Lovely. Right. Now give them more polish. Okay then, so let's get these all polished and uh, this will be the final bit on these B formats. Because the picadors are white, they do show up muck and dirt very easily. So because of that, we have to be careful. Now I'm not going to, I'm just going to give these a cursory wipe over, to be honest, because of their nature, not a great deal you can do with those. I will end up popping them into um, bags and I'll pop them with the rest of my new worlds, which are actually with my compact paper bags at the moment. So. That's those ones there. It's funny, uh, Nicholas in his first book, um, White Spines, he does mention how he cleans up his books with uh, a bit of furniture polish as well. So there you go. Great minds, Richard. Great minds think alike, that's what it is. Great minds think alike. I have featured Richard's collection just using his uh, Instagram pictures on my uh, channel in one of the collections videos. So have a look back over that, viewers, viewers' collections. Let's take a little bit of time on these because I want them to be literally as good as I can possibly make them. Generally speaking, all the uh, picadors do benefit from a clean. This one, very, very grubby back cover, but nothing to clean up and improve it slightly. I'm not, I haven't counted up exactly how many books Picador published between 72 and 1990, but it's got to be a few hundred, hasn't it? I'm almost scared to look really, but I'm not like obsessively collecting them like that, but it's nice to know when you come across them, if uh, if you, if it's one you're looking for or not. Because they do look rather stunning when they're all together, you know? This one's a much more recent one, so it's in pretty nice condition. And I shall actually shelve these in published order by year. So I'll break each one into the year, and then I'll uh, A to Z it by author's surname. I think that's how I'm going to shell these. Because that's just the way we roll here. Lovely. Yeah, I don't know if this was a good buy or not, really. I, I'm going to probably get rid of it 
in all honesty. Um, if I can come across the original, Brett Easton Ellis is one of those authors, a uh, good, good author to pick up. But this is not really, it's a bit late for me. So it's a mere placeholder for now. This one's a little harder to pick it, pick up, particularly in the first. As I said, there is a. I think the second is revised slightly. No idea exactly how it's re revised, but I, I got this for a fiver, so I thought that I did pretty good on that, um, considering the age and size of it and the subject matter. I saw some online that were about. The 10 to 12 mark that were like really quite nice condition. You know, not perfect, but very, very nice. It's a tiny nick in the bottom of the spine there. Which, once again, I'm just going to grab with a tiny bit of Pritt stick. I use my screwdriver there. Pop that in there like that. Squidge it in. Get rid of the excess. There we are. That was quite nicely done. Okay. This one doesn't seem so bad, but there's not a lot to point out when it's white like that. Uh, coloured rather. The back, however, shows up all the muck, so... Remember this one being published? Flying through these now. Yeah, get rid of quite a bit of dirt off some of these.
make quite a difference on this one actually. Needs a bit of the old elbow grease, but. It's come up all right. grubby back cover on this one more so than some of the others that we've looked at but it's going up all right on the face of it it's okay non-friction one here this thing is non-friction oh, autobiography yes yeah, so yeah non-friction Three books in one, it's a little omnibus. Yeah, I've seen this one go actually sell for about twenty pounds. This one, so probably one of the slightly more collectible picadors. I think I think the most expensive one is the picador paperback original release of American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis, which I think is about a hundred. Um, I haven't got that one. Uh, I believe it was a paperback original. Before it was a hardback, which Picador did do later on, but the hardback itself, I think, first printing goes for about 90 quid, something like that. So, one to keep a lookout for. If you get lucky.
last one of these B format beauties. Okay, right, that's all them, cool. Okay, so we'll carry on and do another stack. We've got two stacks left. We'll do another stack of A format right now. And uh, this one was one of the issues of New Worlds that I was after. Um, yeah, New Worlds number 156. So one of my viewers uh, picked up because I said I was after a copy of this particular one, uh, Phil Redhead, he's called, and um, Phil was going to be going to the London paperback show, and he said, well, look, I've got a spare copy, which is uh, not too bad condition, and um, why don't you, uh, why don't I bring it down, you can have it. So I bought it off him, rather than um, paying an extortion amount online for one. Um, the reason this one goes for good money is because it's got the second professional published work, by Terry Pratchett, who's of course collected in his own right. Um, it's uh, this one here, um, Night Dweller by Terry Pratchett. There we are. So it's only a six page story, but because that one's included in this one, um, it's expensive. Now, Phil, if you are watching, um, I do also need number 142, which is the first one in this format. Um, so if you've got New Worlds 142, I'd also be interested in one of them as well. <laughs> Now, I was pleased to get this. This is uh, the Reluctant Legionnaire. I do actually own um, Taylor's cover rough for this one, but I didn't know own the book. So I was particularly pleased to get this. It's not in the best of shape. It's very, very tanned, but at least I've got a copy for now. But I would like an upgrade on that one, but still nice to have, so that's okay. Um, I think this is one of those ones that was a couple of pounds from the Ephemera Fair. SF24, so reasonably early Badger. Right, 15 pounds he had on this one, wow. Well, somebody had 15 pounds on it. I said I only paid two, so I thought I did pretty good. Don't know who was selling it for 15. I mean, I don't know. Badger are very, very collectible, but I think this one would need to be in much better shape to be asking 15 pounds. That's very uh, sort of EG at best, isn't it? You know, but there you go. This one, however, was lovely. So this is, uh, this came with a lot of the Agatha Christie's and he had a little batch of penguins, but I had them all by this one. So we just, uh, Threw this one in for a couple of pounds for me. 1964, look at that, it's a really nice condition, really square, pretty much unread, very nice jacket on that. Who's the illustrator? Alan Aldridge again, yeah, so doubly cool to have that one. Um, yeah, this was nice. This was um, a very early four square. I think it's four square number eight, as I recall. Let's get it out of the bag. Yeah, look at that, four square number eight. So I think I've almost got the first 10 now. Um, without going massively out my way to find them, you know. Uh, let's have a look at the printing history. There we are. The first published is Foursquare 1950. This is the reprint from March 58, although in all honesty, I don't really mind. Um, it's still a nice early edition. It's the first time I've ever seen it. Um, Foursquare True Crime. Yeah, nice jacket as well. All the four square jackets are lovely, aren't they? They really are. And now that, this is the second compact that I got, um, Land Right. So I picked up two off the little list, the pretty short list now that I actually needed. 
and this one had a bit of pen on the front cover unfortunately but not the end of the world yeah a little bit of pen over the two and six but apart from that he's all right This is, uh, is it 66, 67, 66, there we are. Funky, funky jacket on that one. Now this is one of the ones I got off Dorset Bob. It's a very high quality JG Ballard. And Bob's gone to town bagging these up actually. Um, put boards behind them and all, which is above above the call of duty but there we are it's a, a flat very tidy copy look at that 1972 i've got one but it's not the first that is beautiful isn't it just a little brush along the top and that'll be in uh it'll be perfection i would imagine that that spine was red the same color as that and that's faded, probably, but it's okay. I picked up all these are also off Dorset Bob, a few New English Library Christopher Priests. Now, some of these were published by Penguin, and some of them were published seemingly by New English Library. But they do, um, I think most people would agree that the Penguin covers, and I'm sure you've seen those, um, Who's the artist again? Oh, I can't remember. I think you probably agree that the Penguin covers are probably better than these New English Library ones. They're more memorable. But this was, I think this was, yeah, this was before. These would have been the first paperback editions of this. Because I actually have this one in Faber Hardback. Um, so Pan got Christopher Priest a little bit later. But they did do him justice by putting the very nice jackets on. But that's, once again, that's typical, really, of Dorset Bob's quality. They're very, very nice. Here's another one here. And although I am bagging my books, um, I'm doing it in a very systematic way. So I'm not, I will, anything that's come bagged, that's come my way recently, I will be debagging. Um, this one, once again, is suffered from the old sun damage, as you can see. It should be nice and bright and vibrant, like on the back. And it's washed out, but I think it was only like three pounds, so I didn't mind that too much. 1973. Quite an early one for priests. That's pretty cool. It's a nice Valentine. So I was able to pick up a few Valentines lately. Ironically, after I've just sort of covered my Valentine collection in a recent video, I've been able to pick a few up and... Uh, this is number 179. Yeah, very nice. They definitely had a distinctive look, didn't they, Ballantine? And um, here's another for Priest again. New English Library. Very sort of seventies jacket that one, isn't it? Forty p, nineteen seventy six. Beautiful. Now this uh, Penguin One Classics. I suspect this came from the Ironbridge Bookshop in Ironbridge, no less. Um, I visited Meg on my way back from Liverpool and uh, I hadn't been there for about a year and a half. It was great, a really good bookshop. If you're ever in the Iron Bridge, Stroke Midlands, Walsall area, Telford, that sort of way, definitely pay the Iron Bridge bookshop a visit. It's well worth it. Yeah, this is a Thurber. There we 
in here. John, welcome. Ah, yes, yeah, so this one, it says on the back, which is quite nice. It's got a cover by Romick Marber. It was, uh, I think he was a uh, concentration camp survivor. And um, he worked extensively for Penguin for a while in the 60s. And he had the very, very distinctive look. And uh, I really like his stuff. So, yeah, a Romick Marber cover there. It's quite cool. Iron in the Cell, John Paul Sartre. Yeah, it's been a while. I haven't been picking many penguins up. Um, I haven't really been coming my way. But as I said um, earlier in this video, there's a chance. But, you know, I've had a couple of these last year where people have got to contact me and said, oh, yeah, I've got a big collection. I said, okay, yeah, what have you got? Send me some photos. And, you know, they're often, you know, old timers and they don't always know how to do things or can identify a first edition, you know, so you have to bear this in mind. But I suspect um, one of the three collections I've got, um, which has got a lot of books in, will probably end up coming my way with a bit of luck. And in which case I shall uh, obviously process it on film and offer it to you guys first. So definitely keep subscribing if you like Penguin. Because I suspect I'm going to have a big load coming my way quite soon. Like a couple of thousand, I think. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't know quite where they're going to go, mind you. But, you know, ha ha ha. We'll deal with that when we can. I said it was almost an embarrassment, this, but I've had so many good books come my way. A combination of lots of trips and stuff. And just bananas. So I need to very much not buy anything in April. Book related. <laughs> and so far, I've stuck at two books, so that's not too bad, is it? And those two books are actually included in here. So uh, I'll try and... Uh, it was a couple of B formats, so... I've been good so far, Governor, honest. <laughs> but it's hard. Oh, this is good. This is an early Dick Francis uh, nerve, or one of his earlier ones. Yeah, 1967. His first two in paperback are published by, fiction that is, are published by Pan. And then, uh, At least I think, are they published by Pan or are they Penguin? Actually, I think they're Penguin as well. I can't remember now. I've got them in hardback as well, these early books. And uh, yeah, he's a good author. Or was. Uh, John Updike, The Poor House Fair. Yeah, I think almost all of these came from Meg at the Ironbridge Bookshop. She is a... Or, she is a penguin specialist and does general stuff as well, but um, I will call her a penguin specialist. Please see this one, this Norman Mailer. Good story, this one.
Castle of the Antarctic, of Antarctica. Another modern classic. Don't pick these up anything like as much as I'd like to. It's a little insertion. Sandals. Large loaf. Piece of cucumber. There you go, you see. <laughs> Sandals, large loaf and a piece of cucumber. In 1961... That's what they were shopping for. A certain D. Osborne. And that is very much what you would call an insertion. And the last one for this pile, we still got another pile of A format to come. What's that little fella? The Age of Scandal. Once again, in excellent condition. Which is the way to have them, if possible. Later ones, I really do only want them if they're, you know, really nice nick. And that one is very much in nice nick. Brilliant. Next stop, let's give them a brush down. Okay, so let's brush them like Billy O. Blooms of uh, dust coming off these, but it's for the best. Need, uh, these will need a polish as well, so we get straight into that now. Cleaning the lens, cleaning the lens, cleaning the lens, cleaning the lens. Okay, a clean bit of cloth, I do believe, is required. Typical four square, it's a bit of a rippler. Just how the glue and binding is done on these. 
particularly the bigger books. Something like this though, <clears throat> gonna need very minimal cleaning. This is such nice nick to begin with. Hmm. That's actually got the remnants of a sticker just covering the Badger logo there. which now that I've seen it, it's quite annoying. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is put a bit of targeted polish on there. And put it to one side to soak it. Reluctant Legionnaire. <laughs> I'm glad to be finally getting this one. <sighs> Got the compact ripple. <laughs> No, a sticker on that badger is just like ingrained, so it's not going to come off, sadly. Not to worry. I don't want to rip the cover, so I'll just leave it as is. There we are. 
lovely. I'm going to take a small break there. Okay, so a few more hardbacks to do, and what a lovely one this is, Time Out of Joint. It's uh, one of the science fiction book clubs, and uh, this was from my friend uh, Dorset Bob. Now, it's in a quite a basic plastic dust wrapper, so we'll get rid of that just for a minute, and we'll go through the book itself and make sure it's in nice condition. So the British Science Fiction Book Club actually published two by Philip K. Dick. Yeah, this was 1959. I I'm not 100% sure, but this might this might be the British first edition of this one. Um, certainly, um, some of the British science fiction book clubs did end up being the first time those books were put into hardback in the UK. But as I said, there's two um, in the British Science Fiction Book Club series by Dick, and this is the one. This is the first one I've got. I particularly like it because it's got the um, the original uh, wavy jacket, which the original ones had. Now, as I said, it's got this very basic plastic sleeve on, which has done its job. But I'm going to take it off now because eventually I should be popping this one into an actual uh, Mylar sleeve. So I'm going to pop it back on unsleeved just for now. But it's done its job. A few little closed tears on it, which um, I shall get sorted out when I put it into a new dust wrapper sleeve, a mylar protection. I shall flatten these bits out as best I can. But that's quite a nice little one there. And Bob actually gave that to me as a gift because he's such a nice guy. Um, for giving him a hand at the paperback show so that was uh particularly nice thank you very much for that bob it's a real gem absolute gem that one um this one i picked up at the toy fair i've got it to read but apparently it's a real fantastic one and uh, quite tricky to find in this first edition hardback and it's the story of how the uh the main die cast manufacturers in the uk so that was dinky corgi and matchbox sort of uh fought each other in the toy wars so uh yeah it should be a uh, quite good fun this one i picked up in liverpool uh flags of the world now, i do have a bit of a passing interest in flags and i've got a few flag books believe it or not can't really do a lot with original boards like this i um, mean yeah, it was three pounds fifty it was really nice. It, this one came out during the First World War, so it was a bit of a dodgy time to be publishing a book on flags when you think about it, with nations falling and what have you. But uh, it's quite nice, colourful. Yeah. Frederick Warren. It's got that little... Uh, like that. I mean, £3.50. You can't complain, can you, really? Not really. So that was too good to leave behind. <sighs> Sometimes do with these. Let's just get the brush into the what they call the rails. Like so. Is a uh, upgrade. This is uh, Richard Beckinsale. Um, this is the chap who was in Porridge. He was Goldberg in Porridge. He was in uh, uh, Rising Damp as well. Um, he passed away. I think he was thirty-four. I mean, absolute tragedy. I, d I don't know what he died of, but it was very, very sudden and obviously incredibly young. He's the father of Kate Beckinsale, who also went on to become an actress. Um, this one was bought from. The shop in Dorset, when I went shopping with Dorset Bob. And uh, as I said, I've already got it, but my copy's a reprint and it's got um, a torn back dust wrapper. And this is a first printing and it's in excellent condition. So we'll take the dust wrapper off <sighs> so I can give it a brush. So 
sound. Quite dusty inside. There he is with uh, Ronnie Barker. Yeah, so this is an upgrade to my existing copy. Just do this one while we're at it. Uh, virtually brand new book on Dusty Springfield. So I'm going to take the wrapper off. Put this one in door I think it cost me nine. She had ten on it. She gave me a couple of quid off. I bought two books off her. I really like Dusty Springfield. And this is the definitive book on her, really. for every record. Yeah, so very, very nice. That's virtually brand new, that one, so that's lovely. Okay, so the last book I've got to show you is something a little bit special. So this is a guidebook to one of the books I'm about to show you. So this is a book about books, and it's the ANC Black Colour books. And these came out at various price points, but the series that I most like by Adam and Charles Black, as the ANC, that's what they stand for, is the 20 Shilling series. And uh, there was just under a hundred of those, and here they all are, and they're rather lovely. And this is a, a, a companion, this is like a guidebook to the um, the 20 Shilling series, as well as the other books that ANC Black published, and they are absolutely beautiful. Gives you the print runs, What the, most of them had limited editions as well, uh, what was happening at the company at the time, um, stories behind the writers and artists that were included. It's uh, It's a very interesting read indeed. And so I've been re researching this, so I picked up a copy of this one secondhand online. And it's a nice copy, it's the definitive book on it, in actual fact. So if you're looking to get ANC Black, this is the one to do. I actually came across two, about a year and a half ago, not two years, a year and a half ago, there was a book shop online and they were selling um, a set of all the 20 shilling ANC Black books. Um, a handful were reprints, but most were originals, and they were, it was about two and a half thousand if you collected. Um, and I was very, very tempted indeed to sell a couple of Star Wars bits to buy them. But in the end, I thought at the moment, I just don't have anywhere for them because they take up quite a lot of room. So I never went for it. But in a way, I sort of regret that. Now you've probably heard of the, uh, the booksellers Jonkers books. Now Jonkers um, have been around for years and uh, they also sell the ANC Black colour series and they had a particularly nice collection of them in and they produced a dedicated catalogue. So there's their, this is this was about 10 years ago, but you can buy all their old catalogues from them. They cost between five and 10 pounds each. So although there's not a lot to it, the photos are lovely, the reference information is great as well. And, uh, well, it's just a nice little addition to the uh, 
to the ANC Black Series. And believe it or not, I've actually got one to show you today. So this is probably one of the most common ones to find. It's on Belgium. They, they're on various subjects, like different cities and towns, areas of a country. Um, there's a few like on insects and things like that, for example. But this one's just on Belgium. You can see it's really, really sort of beautiful. And so this dates from 1908, this one. Okay, so it's 116 years old. And uh, it comes with many plates. It's complete, this one. Um, it comes with, I think, is it maybe almost 100 plates? Uh, almost. Um, Text-wise, there's not masses of text to these because it was all, it was all about the pictures in a lot of cases. Yes, 1908. Big, thick pages. Here we are. I'm not going to go through the whole book for you. But there is 70, 77 illustrations in this particular one. So I'll flick through so you get an idea of what they're like. Each illustration has got like a, what's it called? Um, a tissue paper in front of it to protect it. Oh, very heavy. But you get the idea. They're beautiful. As I said, the, there's lots of different sub subjects, some on Russia, um, some brilliant ones on ancient Egypt and Seville. I mean, just incredible. But the actual text, I see it's really widely spaced. The actual book itself isn't text heavy. It's all about the actual object as is. The book has an object and a, and a real celebration of it. So, so there we are. So that is um, an ANC Black 20 shilling colour series. Do you know how much that cost me? That book, I went on to ABE Books, um, not eBay, ABE Books. That book cost me £8 and the postage was four quid. So it's £12 for a book of that era. Just absolutely beautiful. Now, you know, the most expensive ones in the colour series are, you know, £250 for the limited editions. Um, that had a first printing, I think it was about 3000 only of the very first printing of that. And it's cost me eight quid. To me, that represents a veritable bargain. So let's uh, just do the top edge here. So that is the ANC Black Colour Series. And it's the sort of series that if I'm in the mood. I might treat myself to one, you know, because there's a, a whole list of ones I'd love to get now that I've seen one sort of in the flesh up close. Okay, so, terror in the modern vein. Um, this is the last pile that we've got to do of paperbacks, and uh, we've got another 25, 30 books to have a look at in our A format, and then we will actually be done for the day. So, I think you'll agree. Today's video has been a bit of an epic. It's been a long... I mean, I've had to film it over two days, and I spent probably the best part of a day editing it, so... Uh, I need to uh, wind it back a little and take a bit of a break and just uh, take the time <sighs> enjoying what I've actually picked up. Another bit of uh, science fiction here. But it has been incredible, really. It's been a, an absolutely an amazing, amazing march. There's that second copy of Open Prison. This is one I got after I bought the first one in the uh, charity shop. So good stuff. This will be my keeper. There's something a bit special. This is once again from my friend Paul and uh, Paul Barnes. And he, this is another amazing, amazing book. This is the Crack and Wakes. And um, I believe, and Paul tells me where this particular edition hails from, it is from Spain. It's a Spanish crack and wakes and uh, oh yeah, 25 pesetas on the back. And this is from John Wyndham's personal library. And it's got his little stamp on in there, John Benjamin Harris. How amazing is that? Just, just incredible, isn't it? And uh, Paul also sent me... Um, that as well, which is a, a bind your own, 
from hardback, from paperback to hardback. So quite nice to have that as well. So thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, here's a few more of those Christie's from that collection from the London Paperback Show. If you've not seen the London Paperback Show video, it's probably one of the hottest videos I've put up for quite some time. Certainly in the book world, my toy videos tend to do very well, similar sort of way, but yeah, my toy fair videos, but for the book fair one, it's done particularly good. So if you've not seen it, do check it out. I don't really want to express. With a Tom Adams jacket. Very nice. The Heirs of Earth. September 65. Oh, another old badger here. Science fiction number 40. Exit Humanity. Oh, I've picked up a few badgers. The Hunger. It's another one from Dorset Bob. I don't have much horror, but you know, I've got a few bits and pieces. I thought this was worth picking up with its all black cover. 1982 first. It's uh, not a book from hell, but a nice one all the same. This one I was really pleased to get. I've checked now because I, I wasn't sure if it was one I already had um, in the Galaxy beacon sf series but in actual fact it was the very last one i had to get the mail response so uh, a bit creased on the back but it was the last one to finish the series so i can't be too picky about that a little bit creased up but i mean it does finish them so uh, i can live with it for now but I was certain I had that one you know I was absolutely certain so but there you go Doctrinaire another one of those priests and once again it's a little bit sunned just a little bit but yeah 1971 so that may even be the first uh, first Christopher Priest in New English Library now, on the Barbican, where I live, um, they, the local bookshop had three for five pounds and they'd had a little run of edge paperbacks in. Now, you may remember that for the last two years, I've been looking for edge number 60 to complete the set. Um, and I was looking, I saw one up on eBay, it was about 100 quid. And I saw another one for 45 and I thought, no, nah, that's still too expensive. Then... Um, a copy turned up at £25 on eBay on a buy it now. It was a completely different seller and I grabbed it. Because to be honest, I think number 61, which is the last one in the series, is actually the hardest. But I, I went through my list and I picked up all the ones which I had in low grade that the shop had in stock. But it was number 60. That was, the la that was proved to me. That was the last one I had to get to finish my set. But I picked up all these other ones to replace my lower grade copy. So delighted to get these, as you can see. They're in nice, nice condition. Because they usually turn up absolutely hammered. And then, lo and behold, they had a copy of number 60 there. This was the last one I needed. And I think it's actually even better than the one that I picked up for £25. So I'm going to obviously clean it in a minute, the same way we did the other ones. But can you believe it? And I'll, I'll have a spare of that one, which I can trade on or, or pop online. Can you believe it? Eh? That's quite nice. It's all from the same shop. A couple of the, uh, the Dirty Harry inspired westerns. Not Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood, Man With No Name inspired westerns, I should say. There's a whole load of those. Another... 
of Ballantyne. Seed of Light. Science Fiction Book Club insert. Yeah, quite a fragile one, that. It's another Ballard. From DB. Day of Forever. Give that a bit of a polish, I think. So again, I've got this one, but as a reprint, but this was the Panther first. There we are, 1967. Beautiful tight copy of that one, which will benefit from a polish. This one's really nice. This is a bit of a treat to myself. So I'll keep the little insert with it. But it was, uh, yeah, to outrun Doomsday. And it's signed by Kenneth Balmer. There we are, Fantasy Con 4. That's lovely, isn't it? So I'm going to put that little... This one came with one of Bob's little signs explaining what it was. So I'm going to pop that inside there so we know for the future. Ah, last few. Another little Valentine. I said, I don't do badly on my Valentine at the show, considering I've just blimmin shown my uh, collection online. Just done an updated video, as it were, and uh, there we are. Then I go and get a load. It's typical, isn't it? But I don't mind. This is very tight. British importer, this one. Lovely. Yet another New English Library science fiction title. This is a little anthology, A Sense of Wonder. It's lovely condition, look at that. Very, very nice, that. I like that one. And the last book is a Frederick Poole, Drunkard's Walk. And this one is also signed. So it's a signed Valentine. Look at this. There we are. Such is his signature. There it is. Not a lot to it, but there you go. 1960. Right, let's give that lot um, a brush. Right, for the final time today, we'll give these a brush.
Right. Next job. Get these polished. Here we go. We're not going to hang around. I've probably taken way too much of your time anyway. So for that, I apologise, but I hope you found it interesting. And uh, I tend to find with the longer videos that people watch them in segments. So three hours is a big commitment. And uh, I understand that. YouTube, of course, if you're signed in and you stop a video part way through, it remembers where you are, which is rather clever of it. But that is typical that I would come across this one again, literally just a few months after paying £25 for one to finish the set. So hopefully I can get that or thereabouts back on this copy. But this is the worry, if I pay big money for like a, that last penguin I need. I pay 200 quid for it or something like that, or even more, depending on the condition. If I really push the bow out, one will flip and turn up, won't it? And then it's like, oh. But I suppose if I'm after it, many, many other people are as well. So I should always be able to get my money back on them. Edge books, they're great. Also, New English Library, of course. As I said, the page quality of the New English Library is definitely questionable, even on a book which is in nice condition like this. It can age very easily, you know. In fact, according to Dorset Bob, Back in the day, they were referred to as fans as New English Lavatory. <laughs> so, there you go. They weren't like Penguin, Pan or Fontana, which I would say their quality is excellent. That's absolutely brand new, nothing to do on that one. This one, I think, does need a polish, though. Lovely. Black cover, very nice. These are actually really quite nice copies of these. I've got some in the series. There's loads more than you might think. I don't think I've got them all. But in fact, I definitely haven't got them all. But I might next time I uh, when I file these away, I'll make a note of what I have got, so I don't double up if I can help it. Thank you. 
So sadly, we're on the last little stack and I almost don't want it to end. But at the same time, it's proved to be an extremely long video. And uh, my April pickups, if I even do any, will be next to non-existent. So <laughs> you're getting a double dose this month. Thanks once again for Paul for sending down this incredible goodie to go with my Wyndham's personal copies collection. I've got quite a few now, so absolutely amazing. Very, very nice indeed. Yes, if you've not already, do please hit the subscribe button. It costs nothing, but it does uh, support the channel quite a bit. Um, helps YouTube know that you're happy with the content and it puts the channel out to more people across the, across the YouTube community. Which is always a good thing. really like the content do consider becoming a youtube channel member or better yet um, go over to patreon and uh, sign up over there from a pound or a dollar um, that's patreon's probably the better way to do it rather than youtube because youtube take like a third of what you pledge whereas uh patreon only take a, a very small percentage at 10 percent and uh, that really does help when uh, youtube ad revenue is very much up and down you know it's not um a living but it is something don't forget i do have a dedicated cleaning channel uh unintentional asmr book cleaning and repairs so if you really love this sort of stuff i have been systematically going back and cleaning all my old collection so if you want to see some of that just look that up type in asmr jewels will probably find it in the search engine and you've got 130 videos a bit like this as it stands right now with vintage book cleaning, which can't be a bad thing. Don't forget to check out my dedicated videos on the Badger books, the two new Badger books, the London paperback show, the Warren and Wignall auction, where that Philip K. Dick came from. My book hunting in Liverpool and Ironbridge, Totnes and Newton Abbott and book hunting with Dorset Bob in Dorset. <laughs> All good videos, I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah, but thank you very much for watching today on this epically long video. And uh, I shall look forward to seeing you again very soon. <sighs> Bye.